Please welcome to the stage your moderator for the event, Principal Analyst at Forrester, Brian Hill. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining today's session. Uh, I'm Brian Hill. I'm a principal, principal analyst with Forrester. Uh, thrilled to be here. And uh, Forrester and ARMA have collaborated now for several years, and I'm very encouraged by our uh, continuing joint research efforts. Um, so today's topic on social media and uh, records management is definitely a very interesting topic. Uh, this market has absolutely huge potential, uh, but at, the, at, at, at present, we're at a very early market stage. Uh, so to help explore some of the emerging trends here and best practices around uh, records management and social media, uh, I'm joined by three distinguished panelists. Uh, so today we have uh, Reed Irwin, who is uh, Vice President for Information Governance and Autonomy, an HP company. Thank you. Also joined by uh, Darren Nip, who's uh, CTO, uh, VP of Products and Solutions for Perceptive Software. Good and morning. Craig Reinhardt, who is uh, Director of Products and Strategy for IBM's ECM uh, Software Group. Good morning, Craig. So guys, uh, thanks, thanks for joining. Looking forward to a, a really interactive uh, dialogue here for a, a pretty early stage market. Um, so why don't we start out with some basics? So um, uh, Reed, I'll, I'll go ahead and start with you. Uh, so thinking about age, vertical market, and functional roles uh, within enterprises, what, what characteristics stand out about social media adoption and trends? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think age is a really obvious one. There's no doubt from a technology standpoint that uh, there's a wave of new technology or a way of communicating, I should say, uh, coming on. But there, you know, when I talk to customers, uh, there's definitely an age difference of who's using what. Because many times in the past, what has driven technology changes has been different. Uh, you know, whether it's IT becoming more efficient, uh, different servers, operating systems, email systems, messaging as that matures. But now it's interesting because consumers are driving a lot of the change. So a lot of the things we're going to be talking about today are very consumer oriented mm -hmm. that are impacting the business environment. So when you think about uh, people in college today, or well, not even college, I have a nine year old and uh, you know, she's texting, you know, wanting to text people. She knows what that is. She doesn't know what email is. So there's definitely this wave that's coming. And uh, you know, we thought email was uh, an interesting topic. Well, get ready, because this is outside the firewall. It's gonna be very interesting. Yep, Two, good point. You, you, Craig, let's, let's jump to you. So uh, maybe if you could provide just some context around different types of uh, social media and, and maybe uh, thinking about how records managers should account for different motivations uh, across groups and uh, plans for shifting usage patterns. Uh, wow, that's a big question, Brian. <laughs> um, well, it, first of all, social media, you need to give it a, a little definition. I mean, and, and I agree with Reid. I think, I think this is a sea change. This isn't going from paper documents to electronic documents to emails, right? This is a whole new way of communicating. It's limited to 140 characters. There's no metadata to speak of, to, to work with. Um, you've got that, so you get this whole new communications form. I think there's sort of three pieces. At least I think of it as, as three pieces. I think there's, um, what happens inside the firewall, the collaborative or social aspects in, inside your company, which tend to be about your projects, your you know, things that you're doing that are uh, company intellectual property. Then you've got the social media that Reed was alluding to outside the firewall, you know, what's going on on Facebook, the communities of interest that you choose to participate in, whether you choose to do that personally or whether you're acting on behalf of your organization. And then I think there's, at least now, and there, there may be other buckets, but this is the way I sort of organize it in my simple mind, is inside, outside, and those are very similar except for the kinds of conversations that you're having in those communities. The third piece is, for lack of a better word, the stream of information that's coming at us, Twitter, or um, you know, the, the streams that go by on Facebook, or just a constant stream of stuff, people giving their opinions, 
Last year, I was tweeting on stage when we did this very thing. So all three of those are very different. We choose to do different things in those areas. But uh, so f how that applies to records manager managers is they all have different characteristics. In some cases, they're different technologies. And you have to make decisions about how to manage the records that exist in those forums. So the, the, so the tweets that, that you did up on stage uh, last year, you, you of course put those into a, a records management application. Well, um, <laughs> no, <laughs> because they were not subject to our policy, <laughs> and which is a good point, right? It starts with what your policy is. So you have to have a policy that defines, of course, what a record is and what it isn't. And uh, what I was tweeting last year wasn't subject to our definition of a record, so no, I didn't have to do that. So it's good to have a policy. Uh, th th this is such a great, great point because, and, and Craig, you're sort of separating the different types. I think this is really important for the conversation, by the way, as we talk today, tweets versus you know internal wikis and blogs and things like that because from a business perspective, how you manage and monitor that and policy is going to be really key. Yeah. So I think the scary part, though, like you say, it wasn't, uh, you know, policy didn't address it, but how would the organization have known is it monitoring that? Is it supervising that? I mean, so when you think about the risk, it, there's a psychological element to it. And, and certainly we're gonna talk about the technology element of it and policy, and I think we'll, we'll drill into that. But it's that scary factor of, well, what did someone tweet? You know, what did they say? And how do you control that when it's on a mobile device? I mean, you know, it just, it, it, it's, it's getting your head around the concept of this freedom of information. It's, you know, free range communication, if you will. You know, it's not inside the firewall. There's no control. So I think, you know, discussing each of these separately is, re is really key. So there, there are plenty of opportunities to, to be very scared, but there are also plenty of opportunities to be very productive and uh, looking at different motivations for using different types of social media. Uh, Darren, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you. So h how should records managers account for different motivations across different groups and plan for shifting use, use, usage patterns? Uh, for example, uh, marketing teams uh, use social media to, to get the, the, their ideas out, but you could also use social media to facilitate a disaster recovery or any, any other number of other uh, scenarios. No, uh, Brian, I think that's important um, because I do think we'll see different uses. I mean, there's common usage of different social media tools, but I think by department we'll start to see um, increasing specialization. For example, HR, they'll take a look at candidates before they come in. They'll take a look at their history of Facebook posts. Some of those things recently we've heard can be used to, at least for a very specific point in time, can be used to determine you know, the applicant's um, eligibility for employment, those types of things. It can't be carried forward, but at least at that point in time it can be. So I think you'll see specialization across different departments and their use of the tools, in addition to the generic kind of uh, generalist approach that people will, will take advantage of the tools for collaboration, whether that be for marketing, uh, whether that be for your purchasing department, reaching out to vendors and using you know, collaboration through SharePoint and other types of tools to reach out to extend and make the business process more inclusive. Because that's one of the things I think that social, mobile, and cloud do is they make business processes more inclusive. And what we find is, at least from a business process standpoint, is that a lot of processes that can be automated have been automated. The ones that remain are more complex, more exception-based, and so you need to take advantage of the social tools, the mobile tools, and those types of things to bring in the experts at the right time and in context. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's actually shift that to, uh, to talking about vertical markets. So clearly social media is very important for, from a uh, financial services perspective. Is it relevant to other vertical markets? And if so, why? I think it's relevant to a number of different vertical markets. You see, I mean, one good example is in healthcare. Um, you see more and more physicians that we talk to, they're piloting tablets, have been for years, as an example. They want to know in context of a patient's record, who else might have looked at this recently? Uh, what have they said about it? What does the patient say when they've left the hospital? What are they telling their friends and family on Facebook, as an example, or LinkedIn, or what are they tweeting? So I think all of that comes together to help paint a better picture about what kind of care they received and how they're feeling about their experience, just as one example. Healthcare is a good example because it's an industry that's going through a major transformation. It's an industry that's used to being paid on volume and being reimbursed by insurers. So the more you patients you service, the more reimbursements you get, right? And, and that's changing now under these new accountable care 
things where th these organizations are going to have to compete based on value um, because the whole model in healthcare is ultimately going to change. So to your point, in the past where this is an industry that probably wouldn't have cared too much about the voice of the patient and, and did they um, have a good experience. Uh, but, but now it does. You know, they do. They want to find, and I'll give you a very specific example. We have a customer um, who is uh, monitoring what people say, and it's, it's, it's in, in surveys and uh, social media. It's an oncology use case. And this is, uh, they want to know how the patients felt about the uh, cosmetic aspects. It was breast cancer, about the cosmetic uh, aspects after surgery and whether they were happy with the outcomes or not happy with the outcomes so that they could ultimately improve that particular procedure. So here's an example of how social media is being applied to get feedback that otherwise wouldn't have been available. So uh, Reed, I'll, I'll turn to you. So I, I think Craig mentioned earlier that there's some pretty profound differences for how you would apply uh, records management to a uh, physical records management use case versus um, uh, social media or static electronic documents, uh, for example. So what, what, what should records uh, managers be thinking about in attempting to apply uh, controls to social media? Well, you know, it's interesting. And I, I want to comment on what Craig said first, because there's this significant change that you're referring to, the voice of the patient, right? How, where did that voice, who heard that voice before we had this kind of technology? So really, patients can have a voice now. And that's happening across all industries. People tweet, people, what you're thinking now, companies understand that. So that's a big part of what's driving this. It's not that doctors suddenly, or insurance companies, or the government that regulates that business suddenly became so uh, sensitive to the fact that we now need to take care of patients. So, you know, patients can respond now. Right. And people see that. And I know who's a good doctor and who's not a good doctor or who does, you know, has good results. This is that kind of communication. And that's good. I mean, this is all good stuff. Right. It's just about how do we govern it properly so that we do reduce the risk. Right. You know, when we went from physical to electronic and now to a greater kind of global, you know, electronics. But when you think about the past and applying uh, policy to records management. When it comes to this, I mean, really, it's kind of common sense. I mean, honestly, when it comes to the policy. From a records management standpoint, your policy should apply to all forms of communication. This is really what that's about. I mean, when you think about things that are in place now, whether it's uh, in the financial services industry, FINRA, and uh, you know the regulations they have around supervising content, you know, they don't have to rewrite a lot of that stuff because it still applies. ESI is ESI, whether it's a tweet or whether it's a document on somebody's desktop. It just resides somewhere different. It was created differently. The challenges are outside the firewall because inside the firewall, and by the way, there are real issues there as well. How do you monitor wikis and blocks internally? I mean, those are challenges as well. But uh, I think good policy is the foundation of that, absolutely. And just to add on to that, um, I think the key, one of the key things that we're talking about here is not so much control, but governance. Because governance is what you can empower users with policies and provide protection for both their, their privacy as well as that of the organization. So it's, it's about governance um, and, those, and the, creating those policies that I think will really help uh, people understand how to use. And to Reed's point, it's not, the medium really is not important. We won't be discussing in a few years mobile. It just is. Um, what's important is the content of what's being communicated and how that content is managed, irrespective of how it's, uh, where it's created or how it's accessed. And so that's really what we need to focus on, I think, is the content. And in some cases, of course, what's also important is the context about how that content what it's related to, because, you know, like Craig was saying, in some cases you have 140 character limits, so how are you really going to decipher what the real meaning is unless they're very explicit in that? So a lot of times in order to find out from a retention or records policy how relevant that is, you have to understand the context that it was used. Oftentimes that can be business processes, but there's also other things that drive context too. So it's about governance and it's about content, and then a little bit beyond that, it's about context and what was... What is the format or what was the construct that drove someone to send that message? Because that is what will be important and determine a lot of times whether that is relevant, unless it's explicit through a keyword or a hashtag or something else like that. 
Yeah, and on the context point, good, good, you know, we're records managers, so we, you know, context, right? It's, it's part of the definition of a record um, in most cases. Uh, but you're going to see adoption of technologies like text analytics that are able to infer meaning from right. text and tweets and, and these kinds of things. And it's, you know, it's already adop being adopted today, but more broader adoption. But the point, the point um, I wanted to make was that, building on what Reed said, is there are some absolutes here? You know, you have to have the right stakeholders involved. And at a minimum, that's, you know, someone from the business, it's someone from RIM, it's someone from legal, it's someone from IT. You have to have top-down executive support for what you're doing. I mean, a program that you're, you know, you're, you're training people on and auditing on and holding yourself accountable. You have to have all the absolutes that we, we know from coming to this event uh, for years. So, so the, the old rules still apply, you know, whether it's email or, or, or those things. What's different is the technologies involved here. Uh, and you have to factor in, as part of your, the, your normal thinking of how to do records, you have to factor in that this is a fundamental new kind of animal. So that, you know, and we're on step one of what's going to be a 20-step journey with this kind of technology. I and mean, this is a sea change. We're, you know, we're not going back to Kansas anymore. I mean, this is not going away. Um, and the technologies will continue to evolve at a rapid pace that no one will be able to keep up with. I mean, it's, it's just going to happen. So part of the, the, the new piece here is do all the old stuff that you've been doing, all that still applies, but get familiar with these different technologies, how they work. Because if you're going to choose to capture these things and manage them as records, then you're going to need technology to do that. Because it is so much information, there is no way that's going to be done manually. I mean, it, we're, you know, 500 million people tweeting a day. And I read all of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's interesting. If you use a kind of a football analogy, I mean, there's really only three things you can do as an organization. Block, just say no. Nobody's going to use social media. Well, that doesn't seem reasonable. You know, two is just punt. Oh, forget about it. It'll take care of itself. Well, that doesn't really seem reasonable either. Or you could tackle it. You know, let's do something about it. But what that do something is, is going to differ based on your risk profile, what mm -hmm. business you're in. You talk about financial services. I mean, you even kind of said, that's sort of obvious, that's regulated. What about the other stuff was your question? Well, that right, just because of the way, you, or the way you pose the question sort of defines different verticals with different risk profiles treat things differently because of their risk profile, what they have to manage. It's right. interesting. I'd yeah. say there's a fourth, and that's pass. <laughs> um, <laughs> Give it to somebody else. But pass down the field and be aggressive. And I'll tell you why. I can't tell you how many customers we meet with where RIM is left out of the conversation. You, get it, you go in and meet with, you know, they don't have the right stakeholder alignment. It's hard for the RIM person to get a seat at the table. And sometimes that's because, uh, the, you know, there's a whole lot of, you guys know, you guys know this, right? This is a surprise, there's a whole lot of reasons. I would have called that a huddle. Well, but my point is, is this is an opportunity to get in front of this in your organizations now. Don't wait like we did as an industry for email and put our heads in the sands. Yeah. Oh, it's, you know, this is something that you have to get in front of now. And if you do, you'll have a seat at the table and be part of setting those policies and procedures. Well, let's talk about prioritization, uh, because we, we've talked about email, we've talked about physical records management. Clearly, social media is really, really hot right now, and there is an opportunity for uh, records managers to, um, uh, to take some leadership around this. But you, at the same time, you, you can't tackle all types of electronically stored information in your organization, and different verticals are going to have uh, different uh, legal and compliance uh, risk profiles. So ha what, what guidance do, do you have for records managers about how they should prioritize uh, tackling um, uh, social media? Well, it, you didn't say this in your question, but it, it almost begs for what do we do first versus second versus third? And the volume of information is really the biggest issue mm -hmm. because if there wasn't so much, you wouldn't have to say, let's do this first and that's it. You just do it all. But you can't do it all. But one thing for sure is that this begs for automation. I mean, there's no doubt about it because manual records management, if you will, or even asking individuals to do something with everything they create just isn't reasonable. And um, I, I think you mentioned it, the, sort of the fact that these are brief communications, especially tweets. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about context, and you mentioned context. How do you have context when people are 
saying OMG and all kinds of, you know, SOL. Smiley something. faces. Yeah, I mean, what does that mean, you know? And, and so how do you connect the dots? What is risky, what isn't? And uh, that's really hard. So that ability for records managers and the organization uh, all the way up and down, all the stakeholders, compliance, risk, legal, IT, the ability to understand their content is what's really gonna help them manage it. Sure. What do you keep? What do you get rid of immediately? Um, what's under, you know, what should be managed under policy versus not managed under policy? This is really critical information and that begs for the right technology to manage that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, automation, um, couldn't agree more with um, the fact that there's way, I think one of the reasons why we don't see great adoption today, uh, we see some adoption even the retention policies into from uh, physical retention of physical records into uh, ESI is because um, it's just too difficult, it's too complex. Uh, people are already full up with their existing work that they have to do and then to have to scan in some cases I see some studies that say some departments or some companies have 150 different retention policies. I mean, my goodness, can you imagine, not only having, you're trying to figure out what you want to put in your email so that you don't, so that you, uh, so that you look like you know what you're doing and you know you, you can be effective, but now you have to figure out what to do with that across 150 different policies. So it's about, you, you have to keep it simple. It has to be automated. Uh, there is just way too much information and content going around to do that. And that's one of the reasons why I think, to your question, Brian, is that as you extend your policies into this type of information, I think the way, to, the way you probably have to achieve those gains is to start with specific higher risk areas of the business. Focus on those first, get those policies. You can have a generic, pol I mean a general policy that will cover the format and the kind of the main, the big hitters of the content types and those that you're talking about, keywords, but then to really get specific, I think, and to bring value to the business fast, is you're gonna have to pick certain areas of the business that you can collaborate with the right stakeholders and get something done. Because I think otherwise people are going to be frustrated and it's going to take too long to realize the value and the from the risk protection and those other types of things. I think the other thing that has to happen is we have to figure out some way to tie this to the top line. And if you can tie it to the top line for the business, um, then I think that you'll see even greater uh, interest in getting these policies and those types of things implemented and adopted. So if users start adopting it, they're already bringing the technology and if you make it easy, if it's seamless, then I think that will advance the ball quite a bit. Can you that give an example of how you might tie that to the top line? Well, I, you know, it's meaningful use as one. Uh, I was just trying to think of that earlier when we were talking about healthcare. Um, you know, meaningful use in healthcare is just one example where through auditing and through governance and through those types of things, Entities can go to the federal government and get funds back based on their performance, based on what they can that, that they can prove was the quality of care that was rec that was given to the patient, and the quality of care can now include these types of social tools, and what they tweet and what they Facebook about. So that's one example that that can then bring information back in. Another one is in education with research and grants and those types of things, because again, there's a lot of collaboration that goes on in a in a research community, and so a lot of especially you know, research type schools, they can leverage that kind of media and that kind of collaboration and that kind of context to show how influential they are in the community, the higher ed community as an example of research, to drive additional investment dollars. I think that's going to be increasingly person, uh, important, not only from a personal level, but from an institutional level. Mm -hmm. B building, sort of tying your two points together, social media is a wealth of information that creates revenue growth opportunities for your business. To what Reed was saying earlier, people you know, tweet about what they're happy about, their experience with products, whether good or bad. You know, I just bought an iPad. Well, if, 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 I'm an, if I'm an accessory vendor for iPads and somebody tweets that they just bought an iPad and I had the opportunity to reach out to that person and pitch them on my new accessory that went with the iPad, wouldn't, that's, that's irresistible for vendors to you know, mine these social media and find new business opportunities. There are whole new business models emerging. So that's one way to tie it to the top line, right? If you can tie your project to something that increases revenue for your company, that's a good way to get funding. But going back to your, your, your point about where, where, to, where to start here, the first thing you should do after this conference when you go back is find out if you have a social media policy. And if you don't, then you should help create one. And in that social media policy should be the records keeping policy to go along with it. What's gonna define a social media record and what will you guys do to manage it? Um, 
and you know, it goes from there, right? So don't wait around for somebody to come and tell you, hey, we put a policy in effect. You guys should be part of that policy creation process. And then as far as where to start, a, good, you know, a, a fail safe there is where is your risk? What is the risk profile? Talk to legal, you know, understand where the high risk areas are, understand where the, the business opportunities are, and look at those kinds of dimensions, risk, and, and the trade off of, of, against opportunity and you'll find pretty quickly where to start. Yeah. So Craig just mentioned uh, the, the importance of developing policies around social media. So wh who should lead the charge for that? Should it be records managers? Should it be legal? Who, who should spearhead that? Oh, I think it's, it, it, I mean, well, we're in a conference for records managers, so I'll say you guys should spearhead <laughs> yeah. it. But, um, <laughs> we know what the answer is, Craig. But yeah. it's these guys. But, but I, I, I think any of the key stakeholders you know, have the responsibility to the, whether they, who should is, they, they all have a shared responsibility in having a policy in place. It's not, I mean, it's not like it's snuck up on us, right? You know, Facebook, yeah. you know, there's now a movie about it. <laughs> um, you know, and even that's two years old already. So, um, yeah, it, well, and, and it's, everyone gets this. You know, this isn't something you've got to, gosh, I wish the guys in the executive suite really understood about social media, are you kidding me? Everybody understands this on some level. They may not clearly understand the value proposition of what it can do for the business, nor do they clearly understand how to manage the risk in their business based on their profile, but the awareness is there. They get it. So to get that conversation going on this topic is gonna to be a lot easier than it has been in the past. Yeah. No doubt about it. And the other thing about, again, to answer your question about what's the value for the business, and, and I think this is important to really help the business understand uh, you know, how it can create more business and drive revenue is the community itself. I mean, isn't that what this is all about? I mean, that we've mentioned communities uh, so far and the ability to define groups of people who are interested in iPads, for example, but anything. Uh, people are talking about this stuff. So now, instead of having to get, you know, a phone bank of people to call people on what are you interested in thinking, it's out there already. So you get this immediate feedback. So business can respond much faster. And that's why business needs to adopt these tools. Because if the consumers, uh, or e even if it's business to business, this kind of communication, they're responding immediately. The business needs to respond as well and make that the way they communicate. Are, are the sets of stakeholders that, that records managers should work with to, to define policies around social media, are they different? Uh, for social media than they are for other types of ESI or physical records? No, no, not, not, not at all. Uh, uh, the, the, the issues are the same. The fact that uh, the freedom of people to say what they want, you know, unfettered is sort of the scary factor, the risk. But the policies really aren't that different. You know, ESI is ESI. You still have to be able to control it, find it. It's discoverable. Uh, but, y you know, there are, d the technology itself sort of defines the fact that it's harder to manage, people are trying to figure out, well, what does this really mean? Because people are doing this outside the organization and thinking, well, that's different. But the fact that they're doing it, I mean, if, if you were to take these devices away from people, they're still thinking this stuff, they're still saying this stuff to people, you know, and a lot of it, just by the way, is sort of common sense, because there's a lot of arguments about, well, can uh, someone go to your Facebook page and say, what did you say about your boss? You know, well, and this gets to privacy, right? Well, you know, what's really private, what's, what's not? So there is this interesting mixing of what people perceive as their rights and what is their business life versus their social life, which I think is, personally, people have a, a hard time getting their head around that. I think that goes back to the initial, one of the initial questions about age. I mean, heck, my mom uses Facebook more than I do. You know, she's in her 60s. So in some cases, age plays a factor. And in some cases, I think it more plays a generational impact in what is private versus what is, uh, what is private versus what is public. And I think that's the fundamental difference between kids that come up and have been using these tools and then they enter the workforce, they've been saying all types of things. They would have continued doing those types of activities. Whereas other older generations, they have more of a sense of what is public and what is private. Like Craig was saying, most people would say you shouldn't say anything on your Facebook page related to the business really or to your 
to your boss or your peers or anything like that. But again, that does need to be part of your policy. It needs to be an extension of what your, your existing ESI-based policy is about. So the, the, the privacy angle is really important. I, I want to come back to that. <clears throat> um, but before I do that, I, I want to uh, close out on some policy development issues. So you, you mentioned that you should have the, the right sets of stakeholders in developing the, these policies and the usual, usual suspects. Uh, I'm curious if you have recommendations for, for how, how those groups should be organized. Uh, it, it, should there be a steering committee, working groups? It, should it be an ad hoc collaboration? Should it be formal, informal? What what works best? I, you know, there is actually uh, a group. I, I assume most people are familiar with the EDRM. Uh, I co-chair the IGRM, which is a reference model that uh, really kind of addresses that first box, the informa information management box. Uh, but I uh, co-chair it with actually someone from IBM, and uh, the whole point uh, of this model which, by the way, ties directly back to GARP, is bringing these things together so you have the right parties. And I suggest you, uh, I'm, I, again, I hope everyone here is very, very, very familiar with the GARP principles. But if you tie that back to the IGRM model, you can see that we've built a reference model to help facilitate exactly that conversation. And those people get them talking. Doesn't this sound familiar, though? I mean, when we've talked about you know, other policies, getting the right people together at the table, uh, and, and that's why, you know, when it comes to who's driving it, this is a terrific opportunity for the records management community to do it. They own that policy. They own those schedules. They got to apply to this new media. It's relevant. It's important. And it's, it, well, it's never been more important. Yeah. Um, just one, one thought on stakeholders. In, in, in the current evolution of, of social media today, particularly going back to my three buckets of social media, the outside, the firewall, and the Twitter stream uh, bucket, um, the marketing organization in your organization cares a lot about that. And they may not have been a big stakeholder in the past, but when you think of which business stakeholders should be involved in social media policy development, I would include the marketing stakeholder. I would, on one other thing on the stakeholders, is I would get a diversity of range, of ages. So yeah. as you're developing those policies, because we've talked about that already, make sure that's part of the team that you have so that you can, you can check with the 20-something that just graduated from college that, has known, that it is already social. Talking about social to them is like talking about color TV. Um, so make sure you have a range of people that you have on your, on your, on your teams so that you get the full perspective. Yeah, and, and there's one form we haven't mentioned that marketing, I, I think all three of us probably appear on, but on YouTube. I mean, you talk about a marketing opportunity to have presentations there talking about your products or services. I mean, incredible, incredible opportunity. So uh, among uh, vendors that supply uh, technology that, that control uh, social media, how, how do you rate their maturity? How's the, the industry doing for controlling social media? I would say it's more about, again, I think it's about governing, managing than it is controlling, because I think controlling implies that it's somewhat um, it's somewhat, uh, you know, big brother. Um, but on the governance side, I think that um, one of the ways that we advance what we do, and I'm sure my um, peers do the same thing, is we involve our communities of customers by sector. We take advantage of social tools, get their feedback, get the wisdom of that group to help us as we advance the, the, the projects uh, that we are involved in, mostly in our cases around business processes and collaboration and those types of things. But you have to use these same tools to do those types of things. And communities are a great way of doing that. Short answer, very immature. I said earlier, we're on step one of a 20-step journey here. The, the tools are farther behind than that because, you know, first there's a problem, then you start figuring out how to solve it through technology. So very immature. You're going to see a big evolution here. Um, but what's interesting, sort of to your point, is, and what's really different, with the sea change here, is that if you think back to electronic documents and emails, we're, we're a culture, all of us in this room, because we're here, we're control people, right? We like stuff organized. Most of you have library science degrees. You know, we have our structures and we want our stuff in the right places, right? That's just the way we're all wired here. Well, to quote Maxwell Smart, Right, this new technology is gonna be the battle of chaos versus control. There is so much of it that it's not gonna be possible to control it all. And it, it really is not. So this is a fundamental aspect to hear that, you know, we have to understand 
you're going you're gonna to have to try to control what is relevant to your business, which is not going to be all of it. And that's where we're going to see a lot of technology evolution. Huge. And uh, in my experience, and I, I'll bet this resonates with, with everybody, but I'm finding that you're either a filer, you have, you put things here, there, there, or you're a searcher. You just want to search for stuff. And there is kind of an age gap there, although I tend to be more of a searcher because it's easier. I'm falling into that group. But I'm more wired for the control. Uh, but it's, it's interesting that that's what's happening. They just want to find stuff, search it, get it. That's it. So that's an evolution that's happening as well. And that's why, I, I mean, as vendors, I think technology is really the solution for a lot of this. Or I should say automation of things so that users don't have to do something in order to affect that policy internally, but that technology can help facilitate that to allow people to get the information they want, understand the information, you know, and leverage it for the business, you know, in the best way possible. So Reed uh, and Craig said that we're at uh, stage one on a 20 uh, stage um, uh, process uh, for, for these types of tools. Is, is, would you share that assessment? Uh, yeah, there, there's no doubt we're on the we're in the early stages of this, and uh, you know the the vendors up here are trying to address it. You know we've got a lot of you know customers in highly regulated industries, and and we're collecting everything from you know IMs and uh, you name it. Uh, you know the insurance companies is actually a big one because everybody wants to do business on Facebook and set up their Facebook accounts. But you know the way those industries are addressing it is they're having people uh, you know, attest to the policy and allow the organizations to monitor that, you know, what they're posting, uh, whether it's on wikis, blogs, uh, Facebook, uh, any of their IM, and it's being collected and it's being supervised. You know? So anything that falls under the FINRA you know, or regulation, those highly regulated financial industries, those broker dealers are being monitored and, and we're doing that today. But you know, we're not someone on a mobile device out there tweeting something, that's, that becomes a little bit more problematic. So there's no doubt we're in the early stages. Things are really evolving, evolving quickly. But uh, there are those industries that are, have to be harder core about it because uh, the government's on top of them about it. That's a key point. You know, this is where we've been talking, we've danced around this industry topic and given a couple examples, but industry by industry, this is really key. I mean, in financial services, it, it, it's a big deal. There are other industries who have other problems, you, you know, where, where the, the, the social media is helping sort of uh, evolve. Um, but, um, you know, I was going to go back to the, the, the technology saying, okay, so maybe it's step two on a 20 step journey. But, it, but uh, you know, the, the macro point is it's early days. What's, I think what, what's interesting about that is also is that we're standing on the shoulders of all the technology and tools that have helped manage email, right, as an example. And so, so the, a lot of the, it's not, I, I, I should say that we understand the differences between what it was to manage more static content, things like email, and now moving into more dynamic content, burst content, like what we're seeing here as an example. But there's a lot of things that we've learned, and this is evolutionary, so it's not like we're gonna forget everything that was used to manage email, we're gonna take those. And so that's why we're probably at step one and step two, but we have a vision or a long view of what those next seven or nine steps look like as an example because of the lessons that we've learned in capturing the prior ESI type stuff and what worked and what didn't work. Well, let, let's actually talk about what some of those next uh, technology steps are. So I, I think that we're all in agreement that this is a pretty early stage market uh, from a, uh, from definitely from a tools perspective. And so what, what, are, what are some of the next major technology advances uh, I, I'm not asking for plugs for, for your individual companies, but, but just a, across the industry overall, what, what, are, what are the major components of tools that will allow you to uh, control and govern social media more effectively? I guess I'll start, and um, I, what I'd say, a couple things that have already been men mentioned is one is automation. Um, you know, the, the, the sites are dynamic. In some cases, you have better access through APIs than others. We've seen people that do screenshots, snagits, file imports, logs, keyword lookup, hashtag type uh, extraction. So we've seen those types of things already. And, and those are gonna be increasingly important. Um, what, what, what the inference that Craig talked about, the semantics related to uh, things that don't mention a specific keyword, but that are still relevant and discoverable, it's those types of things I, I think that will help. And that will help in terms of putting the right set of metadata around 
the, this, this and so that it can be searched and so that it can be related. Because I think what's, what is important and what the, the big step will be will be the, the semantics, the context, the inference around these re, what seem to be unrelated um, chats and Facebook posts and actions and likes and comments and bringing that together to, to provide the true relevance around what is uh, what should be constituted record and what should it be. Because I think some of the other basic stuffs, in large part, the vendors are providing tools today that help do those type of things. So that's one area, because it's all about, it has to be easy to use. If it's not easy to use, it won't be adopted. And then after that, then you, you're going to have to quickly move to, okay, how do I make it easy? How do I take it out of the hands of the users, but yet bring the value to the business that it needs in order to, uh, to meet its targets? Well, there, you know, there are ways to monitor what's out there in the ether on the internet. Uh, and you know we have customers in our technology as a vendor, since you've asked you know, sort of our vendor positions, I mean, there are ways to monitor things that are public. Uh, one of the challenges are those things that you have to subscribe to or the user has to allow you to get to it. Facebook or you, know, you have to be on these accounts. Or there, so there are some challenges there, but in general, t there is technology today and it's the core of what we do is monitoring uh, whether it's audio, video, text, anything that's out there that you can get and understanding the meaning of that content. And that's exactly to, to your point and to the, the tweets, the short tweets. What do these things mean? How do you connect the dots? What's the uh, relevance? What's the sentiment of it? Because you could say something sarcastic. Wow, that was a really great presentation this morning, which I hope you don't actually tweet that, but mean it. <laughs> Uh, but but that could be a sarcastic remark, as opposed to that's a really great presentation. So how do you understand those uh, those kinds of things? And uh, you know our core technology helps you do that. Now that's not the only solution, but just so you know to get it out that there are ways to monitor these things. Then what you do with it is sort of the second the second step. I think you're going to see uh, rapid technology um, innovation in three areas. Process, collaboration, and uh, search or access. Uh, so process. Uh, traditional business process management tools uh, ha haven't been collaborative at all. You made the point about process collaboration. You're going to see you know, a, an evolution into case management that can handle those exception-filled, ad hoc processes that are highly collaborative where the end goal is to make the right decision, which is a very different end goal than traditional BPM, which was always about get, get to the end as fast and cheap as possible. Um, very different set of objectives. So you're gonna see innovation there. The, the second area is around the social tools that exist today. In some cases, they're already outdated. We have Second Life, where you know, companies are setting up shop and doing recruiting of, of next-gen workers. We have, you know, virtual business gaming that's coming out where um, you know the next generation of workers use you know three-dimensional virtual reality as a way to game out business scenarios um, you know that's projected to be a big thing in the next 10 years you know these these are all sources of of record so I think you're going to see things that we haven't even thought of yet for new ways to collaborate in the future the third area is search and access um, I you know and you know we all have searching in our in our uh, products here, but I, I don't know anybody who's really happy with their search experience today. You know, AIM put a study out last year that said 47% of people who are advanced search users would prefer something better, and it's it's a commentary on on search technology. There must be something better. If you think about search, you know, people really don't want to search for something. What they want is an answer. To something, um, and you know, this is one of the reasons why we built Watson, was to provide a mechanism based on natural language for us to interact with information in the way that we prefer, as opposed to searching, which most people are frustrated with. Uh, now, it's not a plug for a product because you can't buy it yeah. yet. But, <laughs> yeah, and searching still better than trying to uh, file, and then as soon as you file something, realize that you wish you would have filed it differently, right? So it's still a, it's still a good option, but I, I agree with Craig. If you can put, if you can deliver the content and at the right time in the business process, then people would much prefer that over having to just do a generic search. It's just very challenging to get there, and that's, that's kind of what we're 
or talking to us. How do you make, how do you do that smartly? But in lack of that, I would highly, I would, I would steer towards search before I would trying to maintain a taxonomy of foldering structures that is, becomes unwieldy as soon as, as soon as you start to create it. Oh yeah, you know, it's interesting the the search, the, the, everybody uses search, my wife, your mother, you know, everybody here, and uh, it, you're right, they're looking for an answer. I mean, that is, a, that is exactly right. So if you think about search tools today, and they, they really do differ, but everyone's familiar with Google, and uh, one of the reasons that that paradigm doesn't work for an organization is because it's a popularity contest. I mean, that's how that algorithm works for Google. What are the most popular sites? That's how you get your results at. When I'm trying to make a business decision, I don't want to know what everybody else looked at. I'm trying to find the right document. And how do you do that? The only way to do that is to have technology that allows you to understand the meaning of the content. So the Watson paradigm, for us it's idle, or the intelligent data operating layer, and which is the core of all of our applications to be able to get what's relevant. But I wanted to go to something else, actually, because you couldn't resist. So I can't. I, 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 <laughs> I said we're going to talk to <laughs> at least two plugs so far. Okay. I don't know. I don't hasn't been on Jeopardy, but I'm sure we could arrange that. Uh, we'll take that match. But uh, <laughs> uh, but what I think is really interesting, and actually none of us have addressed yet, we've talked about collaboration. Absolutely, that's the whole point of this stuff: communicating, sharing, creating communities. Um, creating content, you know, whether it's internal or external, but the one thing that we haven't talked about is, okay, now you create it, how do you get rid of it? Big missing factor. It's the digital landfill, that's what's happening, that's what's being created. Stuff is being created at a much greater speed, and I always, it's interesting because, and this happens to me daily and probably everybody in the room, I will get an email, today probably, that says, adding read, and I'm like, okay, so I gotta read the thread of this email to see what it's, what is it talking about? I, I'm kind of confused at that point. I'm like, well, what is it? So I'll re reply and I'll get another document or I'll research on it and I begin to understand what it is they want me to talk about or answer. So I have a little bit of information and then as I get more information, I understand it better and better and better. At some point, I get overloaded because once you get so much information, you don't know what's going on anymore because there's too much content. And I think that's one of the things that's gotta be addressed. Certainly facilitating the creation of content, allowing people to search, get the right answers, but then getting rid of it appropriately. And that gets right to the heart of records management, keeping content for as long as you need it and no longer based on your regulatory requirements. I think that's a big challenge. Yeah, I think the curation of the content, I think, you know, I, there was some study, and I can't remember if it was two or five years, that says content will double. The amount of content that's created or information doubles almost every two years. It's an unheard of amount, something like zettabytes or something. I'm not even sure how many zeros that would be. But it's doubling every two years. And so, but I'm wondering how much of that is duplicate content right off the bat to some degree. It's a forwarded email. It's a forward on a forward or on a reply as an example. So I think there's some, there's tools that will help with those types of problems um, right off the bat. And so you have to start with those type of basics, right? That's the blocking and tackling back to the, back to the metaphor. Um, but I think on top of that is also the curation of the content related to having, making sure that uh, you understand and you've wrapped it with the right kind of information so you can make business decisions. We tend to think, you know, perceptive a lot about processes and content and how they go together and what applications and what people are using it and when. And so that's how we tend to wrap the things that uh, the, 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 the chats and the, the communities, we tend to wrap it around those types of things to provide that context and that curation so that we can figure out what to do with it as part of its overall life cycle. But I couldn't agree more uh, with Reed. It is about managing that entire life cycle. I think there are some things that you can do to automate some of that to a point, and then you can use business processes and other things like that to help manage those uh, retention record policies when it's not a straight shot into one of your existing policies. So recognizing that this is a, a fairly early stage market, uh, what, what best practices are you starting to see emerge for controlling and governing social media? Uh, I think first and foremost is the, the policy itself. I mean, I really, that's the first part of the conversation we have is what's your current policy around social media? Mm -hmm. And let's talk about that and how, you know, what you have already would apply to it to make it relevant, to make sure people understand. And, uh, you know, depending on your business and your risk profile, you know, if you have a lot of mobile users or if everybody's inside the firewall, it can, it can differ. But the bottom line is applying your core regulatory, you know, records management, GARP, principles to that content in a consistent manner. Uh, the, the way I would think about 
this, and it's 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 the way this is the model that seems to be emerging as as a best practice, is that there's you know systems of record and systems of engagement, and um, I think in the past uh, from a you know records management standpoint we've worried more about the systems of record, and the taxonomy and the file plan and you know where all the stuff should really be, but all of this social stuff is happening not in the systems of record, it's happening over in the systems of engagement. So in addition to the thing that you're talking about, which is policies, executive support, right, stakeholders, right, all, all the things that we, you know, we all know, um, I, I think you, you have to factor that dynamic in to this. And the organizations where we're seeing adoption and those who are getting value from what they deploy is they're connecting their systems of record into their systems of engagement so that whatever policies are being enforced through technology, they're being enforced in a way that the right information that needs to be preserved as records is being preserved as records by linking the two concepts together. So I think historically as an industry, we've focused more on the system of record and as, as this thing evolves, we need to also worry about the system of engagement because there's gonna be an awful lot of records made over there that need to find their way into the latter, the other. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah. I would, um, and I use an industry example. So we have today in healthcare electronic medical records, applications that help manage all the different um, treatments and uh, diagnosis and uh, imagery and those types of things that go into uh, the care of a patient. What most people don't realize is you have your official electronic <laughs> medical of record, but you also, a lot of times, physicians will keep shadow records. They keep shadow records because they don't, the EMR is too hard to use. And because it doesn't do certain things the way that they're used to doing them. So I think it comes back, I'm gonna use that as an analogy to say, it comes back to, even in systems that are built only to manage records, in the most critical of situations, you have physicians and others that will use a shadow record because it's more engaging for them, it's more easier to use. So it comes down, when I think of how this has to evolve, is a couple things. One is, you have to have a generic, you have to have your policy in place. But what you have to make sure is you have to be getting feedback from your users, from the community, how effective is it? Is it being used? How easy is it to use? Because if it isn't easy to use at the base level they're at today, then you know that there's always, there's leakage that exists throughout the organization. So how easy is it to use? Work with your, you, with your teams and people and understand that first, then build on that. And that's what I would say is the next step is build on that. Okay, so what are we doing special for this risk area? What do we wanna do? How do we wanna take it? Okay, let's get feedback on that. It has to be a continuous, closed loop with your users, otherwise you're going to have leakage, you're gonna have shadow records, you're gonna have all those types of things going on. Good points. So let's, let's talk about the intersection of social media and, and mobile. That's, that's a very important intersection. And what, what implications does uh, mobile have for uh, capabilities to control and govern social media? A couple things. One is, I guess it, it depends on, you know, I, I think the term mobile is going to kind of fade away over time because everything that we do is going to be mobile, whether I'm gonna be on a desktop reviewing information or, or on a table or a wall or whatever, it's all blurring, right? So the, the idea of mobile and just in general is that is computing. It is what we do, it is how we work. Um, and so related to that, in some cases we know it's, if you have an application or an app, that gives you, so that's, that's one way. If you download an app, controls can be placed into that app so that you can capture everything and and store it off locally or send it up to the cloud or do some, things like that. So there's capabilities of doing that when a user is accessing uh, social media through an application. Of course, there's APIs that you can plug in and get things as well. But it's, it's a very dynamic, diverse world in terms of, uh, of how you're, of, of, of the mobile devices and your capabilities to get at it. But one way is if, you, if it goes through an app, you can do that. Otherwise, you'll have to put something on the network or something like that. But clearly, that is where people work. So it, ha it um, you, you could almost say you spend more time focusing on how to do that and less on the desktop because that's where computing's going. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, you know, the, the, it's chaos versus, versus control, right? The, the reality of it is, is the, the, the policies and things that we care about don't always, some would say rarely, find their way into those technology pieces where they could make a big difference. I mean, how many applicants, think about your own organization. If you're a large organization, you have thousands, hundreds of thousands in some cases, kinds of different applications. 
out there that are making records. Are they all records enabled though? Do they all link back to your records management system? Electronic records aren't new. We've had 10, 15, 20 years, right, to, to, to figure this out. No, I don't know anyone who's got, who's got all that stuff wired up. Same point. Um, it, it, this is happening here, right? Th there's chaos right now, and it's going to be hard to capture those records, and this is where technology can help. It will evolve, and there will be ways at the server level to intercept, you know, texts back and forth and figure out which one should, you know, through things like, you know, semantic understanding of the relationships or the inference in the text, and then this looks like something that's probably a record we should grab this one. So th those things are starting to happen, but... Um, so uh, as an added wrinkle here, oftentimes employees will, will own their, their mobile devices, yeah. and so you're starting to, to get into the, the, the privacy sorts of uh, concerns as well. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll turn to you, Reed. So mobile, employee-owned device, privacy, social media, records management, how's that gonna work? How's it gonna work? Yeah. Uh, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, first of all, I think privacy is a fascinating subject because you almost have to separate business, uh, the view of the world and the personal view of the world because really what's private anymore? I mean, Zuckerberg, I mean, I mean I, you could quote so many people to say privacy is dead. Really? Well, there, that's why I'm separating laws and regulations of privacy versus the notion of privacy. What's really private? If you tweet something, well, you know, that's not private, you know, but you have people that subscribe to it. You put something on Facebook, is that private? I mean, you can control, you have certain security rights around who you're saying can see it. So is that akin to letting someone in your house versus locking the door? I, I don't know. I mean, th these are interesting notions of what's private and what's, what, what's not. But one thing for sure is it's easier to get to content because, and once it's out there on the internet somewhere, it never goes away. So it's possible to find that content. So I, I think the discussion has to be about the notion of privacy for the, when you talk about the ownership of the device and the, you know, my, my personal life and whether I do business on my personal device versus on physical servers and laptops and things and personal communication because there are you know, laws and regulations around that, not so much in the US but in Europe around what's private and what's not. So I, I think it's an interesting topic to discuss. Darren, would you like to add to that? Uh, just a, a few things, and um, I guess one is is that I th there are techno there's technology to today. I think Microsoft's doing some things where you can have, you know, within a mobile device, you can have virtualization, and so I can encapsulate what I want to be private or you know, what is business. So if it's my phone, I'll have a virtual or an image or a virtual machine running. Um, for all my business related things. Like I do the same thing on my work desktop. I own my own desktop just because I wanted a different uh, capability than what was provided by the IT team. But I virtualize all my stuff that's for work related. So it's not just related to mobile, but I think there is this, it is important to separate um, what is personal or what is private versus what is uh, the, co the, the uh, corporation owns for sure. And you can do that through different technologies. Some are more adopted the other, than others. Um, but I, I think in general, this area is, is probably one of the most interesting and yet challenging areas because I think what, what is private varies by age, like what we're talking about before, and that further complicates um, how do you do these types of things. So that's where the tools become very important. It, well, it also varies uh, quite a bit by uh, jurisdiction as well. So many European yes. jurisdictions have a different view that's of privacy right. than many US right. jurisdictions. It's, it, owning the device is not the same thing as owning the information. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. And um, if you ask my mother who owns the information versus my daughter, you get very different answers to that. The next generation of workers think they own all the information. You know, the information is an asset of your organization. So again, another policy yeah. issue, right? We, it all comes back to, to policy. But um, that's where you have to start drawing those distinctions, regardless of who owns the device or right. the laptop. Um, it's really the information that uh, needs to be uh, governed and managed properly. Yeah. So, so how, how do you tackle that then? I, I, do you address uh, privacy and retention management as part of the, the same training that, that would go out to a broad range of ages within your organization? Or how do you, how do you incorporate the 
privacy policies to a record schedule. How, what, what does that look well, like? See, that's why I think there are very specific laws, again, when you look at Europe and, and how they address privacy. But I want to separate that aside for a second, because you can go and drill into the laws and what, what, what you need to do. But what I think is interesting is, and mobile devices have facilitated this, starting with the laptop and how you could actually walk away from the office and do something at work. When are you at work and when are you not at work? I'm at work all the time. <laughs> I mean, when I'm, when I'm at home having dinner, my, you know, I've got Blackberries, iPads, you know, iPhones, you know. When am I not at work? So it's harder to distinguish, you know, what's work, what's not. You can't just say, technically, this is it. And that's why I think it gets back to the information, because it's not the device. Right. It's the information. I could log into a public computer yeah. and get to my, you know, my personal email account. I've got a web account for my business. The device is really irrelevant. It's the fact that I can do it anywhere, all the time. And that's what makes it a bit more challenging. Yeah. But it is about the information. So a, a lot of folks here in the audience uh, represent uh, multinational organizations. And uh, as we've touched on, there, there are different uh, rules and, and regulations around uh, privacy and retention and so forth. So what, what, what guidance do you have for them in trying to accommodate all of these potentially conflicting um, uh, requests? Tread carefully, right? <laughs> For sure. Um, y you know, we, as part of Lexmark now, we, uh, we're, a, uh, we're established globally, and we get questions all the time about, well, if I store this type of content in the, in the hosted data center, if I store it on premise, uh, where should it go? Uh, and it varies by country. It uh, varies by content type. So again, it gives back to the information. And that's where I think that you have to look at, start at the basis and say, okay, what is in the information? And then, and then bring that forward and say, okay, what do you have policies for this? If, are they, are, they, are they policies that are ground in fact? Or are they ground in geopolitical fears because Germany went to war with France and Germany will have no information stored in France, as an example? So you get a lot of different um, factors that come into this. And there are, there are organizations that provide some ab ability to, um, to clarify these rules. But in a lot of cases, they're not, they're not, uh, they don't exist. And so they have to be created alongside your customer, your prospect, your partner. They have to be created with them and then evaluated consistently to see if those policies are advancing across the different, because th this is still, uh, you know, I like the term, that it's still very chaotic, even internationally. Where policies exist, there's just too many, there's too much gray area in a lot of cases. And, and, and the reason why the policy and or the law was created in some cases uh, can be questioned as well, depending on, I think right now we have a lot of resistance to do certain things just because of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And I think some of that's gonna start washing away over time. Mm -hmm. And that exists globally. Do you, do you wanna add to that, Craig? Uh, no, there, there are no easy answers when it, when it comes to international. There's a lawsuit that UBS was involved with for years where you know, multi-jurisdictional, one jurisdiction said they can't release the information and they were held in contempt. I think it was held in contempt in another jurisdiction. It was the US and I, th I don't remember which European country, but they you were held in contempt here because they wouldn't, because the privacy laws produce the records that were being ordered by the court here. Um, I, I, you, you have to look up the, the details to make sure I'm, you know, citing it correctly, but I'm pretty sure it was UBS. And it's nothing against UBS, it's just the, you know, pretty impressive, large global organization. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an example of how complicated and thorny the issues are um, when you're trying to, you know, deal with uh, those kind of issues internationally, and whether it's social media or, or, or you know any form of information, you're going to have that that privacy thing. But but one other thought on privacy: any, any DoD certified records management software will certainly have within its capabilities, uh, you know, to handle private through the way that the security and access and these kinds of things are set up. So very granular controls that can be applied uh, for privacy. So I'd like for each of you to kind of look into your crystal balls and uh, for, uh, for records managers that have developed uh, successful programs for social media controls and governance uh, over the next uh, 24 months, what are the key elements uh, for those successful programs? Uh, Reed, I'll start with you. Yeah, I, a couple of things. One, I think you need to understand your own business. I know that seems very obvious, but really truly understand how it can be leveraged and how your community, your business is using social media. Uh, again, if you're in a highly regulated business or in a business that deals uh, with consumers versus you know, selling to other business, I, the, the way you use these tools are different. 
but the policy and applying good, thoughtful governance to it really is not going to be any different. Uh, you need to understand what you have, you need to comply with your corporate policies, you need to uh, comply with laws, and when it comes to privacy from a legal perspective, the laws are pretty clear. What's unclear is how do you apply them when information is all over the place. There's no doubt that uh, there are the jurisdictional issues exist, but when content is on a server inside the firewall, it's pretty clear whether or not it's here in France, Germany, or the US, or Canada, uh, what isn't clear is when you're tweeting, well, where's that server? Where's that information? Who can get to it? Uh, where's your Facebook account? You know, all this kind of information. So it gets very, very vague. But I, I think, one, the angst around it will decrease because the acceptance and incorporation into our everyday lives will become simply commonplace you know, laptops, email, the things that we use every day that seem so mundane and we can control those were pretty scary at one time. It's under control, essentially. There's certainly organizations that don't, but in general, we've got tools that can do that, and we get it. We're comfortable with the technology. It's this unknown. Now, what I don't know is what's next, because there's going to be what's next. But one thing's for sure that rich media is gonna be a big part of it. You know, we've talked about understanding tweets and things like that. Well, that's text. What about video? I mean, video is huge. Uh, video is being captured everywhere. How do you discover against or search video? Do you really rely on tags? I mean, those are, again, think about it. That's a manual application of information and metadata against video. That just doesn't work. You need technology that can you can search and do facial recognition in it. I'm looking for, you know, Brian's presentation or something and find that, or a word that's in there in audio or video. That level of technology, and again, it gets back to understanding the meaning of your content. And certainly from an autonomy, uh, slash HP standpoint, uh, that's what we do, and that's where the technology is going. Uh, when you think about what IBM is doing and other organizations, I mean, it's about that level of understanding of that content. So I think that's gonna be a big part of it. I think, uh, I couldn't agree more on the rich media stuff. We see it all the time. Um, content is only getting richer. You know, it's what transformed Facebook and uh, just the addition of pictures helped uh, Facebook kind of really take off in terms of its user adoption. So it's a picture says a thousand words, right? Video is even more compelling. We use it across all different aspects of the business as all of us do. So clearly content's gonna get important. I think over the next 24 months, which is, seems like a long time and in some ways it's not, in some ways it is, is that um, I would, a couple of things. One is, do you have a policy in place and do you, are your users have to, do they understand it? And is it being enforced? Can it work? I think, you know, if you can get, get that done, um, as much as you can. The next thing is, is okay, so how easy is it to use and what are the policies do you have for the higher risk parts of your business? So getting back to knowing your business, where do you want to apply the extra attention? I think if you can do that over the next two years, that's a nice step forward. And then I think the, fin the final thing is, is, is making sure you're aware of all the tools that are available because it's evolving so rapidly. The landscape is changing all the time. The approaches are changing and so an awareness of what is happening so that you can apply what makes sense for you is the third leg of, of what would define success, in my opinion. Great, uh, Craig, I think you'll have the final word. Uh, same stuff we've been talking about, stakeholders, policy, think of systems of record and systems of engagement, um, particularly systems of engagement. You gotta learn about this stuff. Uh, rhetorical question, but how many of you in the room two years ago thought that you could take your cell phone, take a picture of, your ch of a check, and it would be deposited right into your account? Right. Anybody think of that one? What one hand over here? Right. Somebody. Somebody thought of that. Right. <laughs> well, the, what's the transaction of record? Right. The check and the deposit slip. Right. Those. Those are the records from that transaction. Well, guess what? In that model, they they both don't exist anymore. Right. So there's got to be another piece of evidence for that transaction. So think about those systems of engagement as well as the systems of record. Great. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.